welcome to Season 5's Episode 4 of Fire Away, Redner Law's online show focused on the employment law issues that matter to you. My name is Stuart Rudner. I'm an employment lawyer and mediator, founder of Rudner Law, and your host of this very special episode of Fire Away. Just a reminder, Fire Away stream is live online every month, and if you miss an episode or want to watch one again, they're always available on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, LinkedIn, and our website. Now, today we're going to have a lot of fun. Some of you may recall that late last year, we did a clip show of fun TV and movie scenes with potential employment law implications, and it was so well received that we decided to do another one. Now, some of you may remember the show, You Can't Do That on Television. Hopefully, I'm not dating myself too much by reminiscing about that. Today, we're going to put our own twist on it. You can't do that at work on television. We're going to be looking at workplace don'ts. And I was hoping to include some do's, but when we asked for recommendations on good clips to include HR related, we only got the bad ones. Everyone wants to see people doing things they shouldn't do, either as an employer or as an employee. So we've got a new batch of fun TV and movie clips to, uh, to share with you. And I will admit that we're doing this mainly because they make us laugh every time we watch them. But there are also some important employment law lessons to take out of them. Uh, and I will remind all of you that much of our work is caused by mistakes that people make. It's not usually quite as egregious or as funny as the ones we're going to watch, but unclear policies, inappropriate discipline or dismissal, poor communication. Actually, not surprisingly, most of the things we deal with relate to poor communication in one way or another. Uh, so we're looking forward to going to another clip show today. I am joined by some familiar faces. My entire team from Rudner Law is here, on, at least on the legal side of things. So I'm joined by Brittany Taylor, Nadia Zaman, Alex Minkin, and Jeffrey Lowe. We have a whole lot of clips, and we're probably going to be struggling to get to all of them as we usually do on this show. So I'm going to get right to it and turn it over to Brittany with the first clip. Thanks, Stuart. Really excited to be doing this again. It was so much fun last time. So just like we did last year, each clip, clip that we've selected deals with a specific employment law topic. So we're going to try to cover a bunch of different themes or topics through these various clips. So the first few clips that we're going to go through show us how not to engage in employee discipline. So when it comes to discipline, employers should remember the saying, the punishment should fit the crime. In other words, discipline should be proportional to the infraction and in light of, of all of the circumstances. In addition, the right to discipline an employee for misconduct does not give an employer the right to be abusive. There is a line between performance management and harassment. Let's watch some employers cross that line. <laughs> and here's our first clip. Ron, I, I need to tell you something. What is it? I, um, I undercharged a customer by $40 before because he gave me some weird change and it really confused me about what I need to give him. Okay, well, thank you for telling me. It was a mistake, though, I swear. But you know what I have to do now. Please, no. Turn around, please. Turn around, please. Adam. Shame. 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 All right. So the that first clip, just for anybody who didn't recognize it, comes from one of my uh, favorite YouTubers, uh, Viva La Dirt League. Uh, this New Zealand-based group is absolutely hilarious, and I highly recommend checking them out if you aren't familiar with them. So in, in this clip, Rowan demonstrates for us how he deals with his employees when they make a mistake. And at first, he's not doing so badly. He listens to Adam calmly. He thanks him for admitting his mistake. But then things quickly go off the rails when Rowan decides that the appropriate disciplinary action is a public shaming a la Game of Thrones. In the rest of this clip, and you saw it just kind of cutting off at the end there, you see Adam's coworker join in on the shaming. So this is truly a public shaming at this point. Um, so, I mean, with respect to an employer's duty to conduct itself in good faith, this, of course, applies also when imposing discipline. One thing that this clip tells us uh, not to do is to impose discipline in public. It should always be done in private 
unnecessarily humiliating an employee can result in significant bad faith damage awards. We've seen this in a number of significant decisions, such as in Boucher and Walmart. In addition, this response is a little bit over the top, especially if this is Adam's first time undercharging a customer. A more appropriate response might have been a verbal warning in this case, or even a non-disciplinary response, such as coaching or retraining on the cash register or in dealing with stressful situations. So, you know, good try, Rowan, but you're not there yet. In his defense, clearly this is not the first time Adam messed up because he knew what was coming. So he has been ashamed before. So progressive discipline, we use the term often, never involving this type of discipline. Although uh, we were joking this morning about our weekly huddles of under law and perhaps incorporating a weekly shaming. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later on, I suppose. Um, I got to say, one thing I realized when we were putting together our clip spread, you and I are very similar in many ways. But... When we all put together our list of potential clips, I realized how different our viewing habits are. Because <laughs> I put in Simpson, Seinfeld, Superstore. You had Viva La Dirtbag and Horrible <laughs> Bosses and what else? Killing Eve, I think was the other one. That's <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they all sounded a lot more scary than the stuff that I typically watch. <laughs> Anyways, but that's probably a good segue to the next one. You're going to talk about Horrible Bosses, which... Many of our, we've probably subtitled many of our files with that. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because actually last year when we did our show, anybody who watched that would remember that we actually had a few Kevin Spacey as the bad boss clips. And it turns out there's more. Like this is this has become an art form for Kevin Spacey as being a terrible boss. So so let's see see the latest example of how to make your employees uh, hate you uh, via Kevin Spacey. See, this is what concerns me, Nick. You're a punctual guy. You know the importance of being here right at 6 a.m., which is what leads me to think that there must be something wrong with the internal clock on our security system. May have been a minute late. Well, no, but according to this, you were two minutes late. So either you're a liar or this system is off by a full minute. I love this clip because it's not a traditional example of abusive employer behavior. I mean, Kevin Spacey is calm. He's not hurling insults. He doesn't make any accusations. I mean, his tone almost comes across as, as friendly and conversational. However, he's clearly being disingenuous and passive aggressive big time. He's also making a big deal about something that appears to be extremely minor. His employee was two minutes late for work. Who starts work at 6 a.m., by the way? That's insane. But anyway. Anyway, he's only two minutes late, so he's clearly making a huge deal out of basically nothing. It seems clear from the context of this conversation that this employee is otherwise always on time, so it makes the reaction even more disproportionate. Kevin Spacey has clearly forgotten that a disciplinary response should be proportional in context. But he has heeded our advice that you should always investigate suspected misconduct. So he's, <laughs> very he's true. Us, he's giving him a chance to explore, first of all, to clarify whether he was late or not, and then perhaps explain it. So this is a, a form of investigation, not necessarily the form we would uh, recommend in all cases, but uh, many of the investigations do involve having outside documents that you can confront somebody with. Just not in this way, although. Yeah, Kevin Spacey seems to have mastered that, that, that horrible or evil boss mode. So, <laughs> I like that, that Stuart is uh, is kind of taking the employer defender position on our clips today. <laughs> Devil's advocate. That's going to be my role for today. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right. Well, our, our next clip comes from Parks and Rec, and uh, I, I love this one, although hopefully no one has eaten recently before they watch this. So now I'm going to let you introduce it. Thanks, Stuart. So we're going to watch a clip of Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec faking pulling out his tooth in a staff meeting. I'm not street parking my Mercedes. Well, everyone is. I'm doing it. Because nobody wants to steal a Saturn. All right, uh, moving on to recycling. <sighs> you okay, Ron? Just a little tooth pain. I'm fine. Continue. Okay, each department will be getting blue bins. <sighs> Do you need to go to the dentist, Ron? I don't like dentists. Just a second. Hey! No, no. No! No, 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 no,
dentist pulled the tooth out yesterday. But it's always a good idea to demonstrate to your co-workers that you are capable of withstanding a tremendous amount of pain. Plus, it's always fun to see Tom faint. <laughs> So I, I really hope none of you fainted, but you probably know that employers are obligated to take reasonable steps to ensure a safe working environment. Usually those in managerial or supervisory positions are expected to ensure that their staff are not doing anything to jeopardize health and safety. This also includes an obligation on themselves to not pull any jokes or stunts that can have an impact on the health and safety of other workers. Here, Ron Swanson is faking a stunt in order to show his team that he can withstand a lot of pain. That's obviously something you should not be doing, especially as a boss. The result is panic among the staff present and Tom being the most dramatic example, faints on the ground. That's Aziz Ansari. Believe me, there are a lot of ways to gain the respect of your subordinates and coworkers and this is not an example that you should be following. Thanks, Nadia. I, I do love that one. And to, to turn it to a more serious note for a moment, it did remind me of a story I heard years ago at an HR conference. Someone was talking about how they had just undergone their sexual harassment training. And what they decided to do was not only talk to people about what was appropriate, what's inappropriate, but actually do some demonstrations. And so they had people actually acting out examples of sexual harassment in front of a large group of the employees. And in the middle of one of these acting out scenes, one of the female employees ran out of the room in tears. And what they found out later is she had been the victim of sexual harassment and watching this had brought back those memories. So I think like Ron Swanson, they had the best of intentions, uh, but even so they caused tremendous, uh, tremendous impact upon this, uh, this employee. So it's something to be aware of, even if you're not doing something as ridiculous as pretending to pull your tooth out at, at a board meeting. Uh, you got to be mindful that even doing something like sexual harassment training could actually create an atmosphere in which you are causing harm to your employees. Uh, all right, next clip, uh, which one of my favorite shows, Seinfeld. So um, Alex, you're going to take us through uh, one shockingly involving George misunderstanding things. Right. So the next clip is a, is a classic scene from Seinfeld uh, involving George Costanza in the hiring process. I want you to have this job. Of course. Stu Zimmer's online, too. Great. Thanks. I've got to take this call. Listen, I'm really glad that you came in. I want you to have this job. Of course. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> What do you mean, that's it? He never finished the sentence. He got a call. That was the end of the interview. Of course was the last thing he said. Maybe he was going to say, of course, I have to check with my associates. So in this clip, George thinks he was hired or that he was going to be hired. The meeting suddenly ends and he doesn't know his status. Um, but he wants the job, so he just shows up the next working day as if he was hired. And his boss, the interviewer, was away on vacation, so he, he just gets assigned an office. So what lessons can we take from this? Well, employers should ensure that they make co clear communication and, and should document decisions like hiring. And we need to keep in mind that employment doesn't necessarily require a written employment contract. Uh, sometimes an employment, uh, an employment relationship can be found even without one. It's important for employers to make sure they're clear on who and when they're hiring and to provide employment contracts that clearly set out the terms of the employment. It's also important to communicate that to others and not to just rely on one person who might be on vacation. Otherwise, you risk creating ambiguous employment relationships like the one George found himself in. And that's, of course, a never, never a good idea for an organization that's trying to limit their liability. I think how George is able to find himself in multiple ambiguous employment relationships. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. And then one of the things that, that we do in our contracts, or at least we always recommend to our clients, is that we put it in writing right up at the front to make sure people know they have not been hired until they sign and all conditions such as such as background checks have been satisfied. Because you don't want to have those wrongful resignation claims where somebody thinks they've got a job, quits their current job, and then is told you don't have a job. Right? Ideally not when they show up for their first day, but perhaps when they call to confirm. So clarity communication is, is critical as always. So I'm going to take the next clip, which is also from Seinfeld and also involving George. 
Um, and this one is a, a somewhat extreme example of the importance of having bigger policies. I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, it's come to my attention that you and the cleaning woman have engaged in sexual intercourse on the desk in your office. Is that correct? Who said that? She did. Was that wrong? Should I not have done that? I tell you, I gotta plead ignorance on this thing because if anyone had said anything to me at all when I first started here that that sort of thing was frowned upon, you know, because I've worked in a lot of offices and I tell you, people do that all the time. So. You're fired. Well, you didn't have to say it like that. I, I want you out of here by the end of the day. What about the whole Christmas spirit thing? Any flexibility there? Nah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. She wanted me to give you this. So George's reaction, was that wrong? Was I not supposed to do that? It is exactly the reaction that we always tell our, our clients is what we're trying to avoid by having policy so that someone cannot say genuinely or disingenuously, I had no idea I wasn't allowed to do that. And I have to admit, this takes me back to a presentation I did at the Law Society many, many years ago, talking about the or inappropriate use of email and the internet. And I was talking about having what I call the cyber slacking policy, basically a policy that says that when you're at work, you can't be surfing Facebook or you know doing any other personal surfing when you're supposed to be working. And we, um, in the audience in the front row, was one of the well-known employment mediators who is well-known for being pretty blunt about how he feels. I'll, I'll leave him nameless for now. Um, and he sort of shouted out in, in the middle of my presentation and said, well, come on, surely we don't need to have a policy that says you can't sleep while you're on the job. Uh, and I, my response was, well, you don't have to, but it can't hurt. Um, because then you avoid this whole situation. So, you know, you don't need to have a policy because if it's obvious something is inappropriate and somebody does it, you can impose discipline. But if you want to be in an even stronger position to avoid that whole question about whether the person knew that it was inappropriate, having a policy, which makes it clear what is acceptable and what's not, and what the consequences will be if they breach it. It's just going to put you in a better situation, even if, at least for the vast majority of people, it should go without saying. It's always better to, to say it anyways. So we'll transition over to another show that gives us a ton of material. So Jeff, you're going to talk about a Mad Men clip. Yes, thank you, Stuart. Uh, so the clip we're going to watch is uh, two partners of Sterling Cooper squaring off from mutual combat in the workplace while the rest of the owners of the firm observe. It's a lot more entertaining than I make it sound. You have no idea what you're doing. In fact, as far as I can tell, our need for you disappeared the day after you fired us. Mr. Campbell. That'll be enough of that. Mr. Campbell, you and I are going to address that insult. Are you kidding me? No, you're a grimy little pimp. As soon as I raise my hands, I warn you, it shall be too late to run. Fine. You want to take your teeth out, or you want me to knock them out? I know cooler heads should prevail, but am I the only one who wants to see this? Come on. Let's go. Some more? 
That's fine. But consider that my last piece of advice. So, I, I, was the younger guy. Uh, I, I mean, Pete needs to keep his hands up. You want to keep your fists as close to your <laughs> cheekbones as possible. He had his hands down. He was asking for it the whole time. So fr from an employment law perspective, um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, um, an owner has the same responsibilities and entitlements as one of the workers. Um, this includes being provided with a working environment that's where the risks to health and safety are addressed, as Natty has early mentioned, or early, mentioned earlier. Um, as such, the employer had the obligation to ensure that these two individuals, who admittedly were partners, um, did not engage in an incident of workplace violence, even where it's by mutual consent. Um, in fact, uh, Roger Sterling's comment that, you know, we should probably stop this, but I kind of want to see it, acknowledges the employer's liability, if only to immediately set it aside. So if either one of these individuals had been actually injured, they could later on claim that the employer had failed to take all steps necessary to ensure their health and safety. So the lesson here ultimately is, apart from the you know boxing tips that I has provided, uh, is that the employer needs to take all steps to prevent workplace violence. Um, in addition, Lane, um, the English fellow who started the fight, risked being dismissed for cause. Uh, this is a pretty obvious lesson, but don't start fist fights at work, just as a rule. Yeah, we, I don't think we've ever done a blog post on that, but maybe that's our, our next one. But uh, anyway, and just the fact that when the older guy, I forget which one's which, challenges him to the fight, he looks over at the partners for some sort of help because he clearly doesn't want to do it. And they just kind of let him go ahead. Like, yeah, not going to be very, not going to look very good if they if there is a claim. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks for the uh, the fighting tips. So we're going to move on to another one of my favorite shows, Superstore, which I mean, we, we could do an entire episode with clips from Superstore. Um, but Nadia, I'll let you, uh, let you introduce this interesting one. Thanks, Stuart. So we're going to watch a clip of Dina from Superstore conducting a training session on workplace efficiency. My video focuses on workplace efficiency, so get your blinks out of the way now. I need your full attention. Time, it's infinite, or is it? It is not. Every day you are stealing from this company in the form of paid bathroom breaks. And as I always say, you can't be number one if you're going number two. You always say that? I say it a lot, yes. Since the advent of smartphones, the length of bathroom breaks has increased. Oh, hey. Did you uh, know she was <laughs> Two minutes, what? What? 17 what? seconds. Uh, <laughs> you taped us going to the bathroom? I taped you going into the bathroom. But you didn't tape us going to the bathroom. No. Oh, oh okay, wow. good. <laughs> wow. Oh. Damn it, Glenn. 26 minutes, 12 seconds. Horrifying. That must have been Monday because Jerusha makes her sausage casserole on Sunday. It is work. So as you saw in conducting a training session on workplace efficiency, Dina says employees are stealing from the company through paid bathroom breaks. She goes one step further to videotape employees in order to assess how long they're taking for washroom breaks. Obviously, this raises serious privacy concerns. When an employer breaches an employee's privacy, it should be limited to the extent that's reasonably necessary. Employers do not have carte blanche to infringe on their employees' privacy rights. And I think we can all agree the use of washrooms is clearly private. Thanks, Nadia. I gotta admit, I'm, I'm failing in my role as devil's advocate because I don't really have a, a way to defend Dina for this one, but she, it amazes me that show how she always finds a way to go just one step further than you think she ever will. Thank you for that. And now we are back to Mad Men and Jeff. Thank you, Stuart. So this is a scene uh, taking place earlier than in the uh, series than the one we just uh, watched. Um, it's right after Sterling Cooper has been purchased by another advertising agency and the new owners are meeting with the existing owners to discuss how things are going to work. Don, you can either honor your contract or walk out that door with nothing and start selling insurance. I don't have a contract. We're close. We didn't think we needed one. 
Gentlemen. I sell products, not advertising. I can't see as far into the future as Duck, but if the world is still here on Monday, we can talk. Don, hold on. I just love Duck's waistcoat so much in that scene. I'd, someday I'm going to come into work wearing one. So, so as you can see, the uh, the new owners uh, have, are setting out their expectations for the existing staff, including how the business is going to be run. And Don Draper um, advises that he will not be participating in this. Uh, to which the new owners, personified by uh, by Duck, take the position he has no choice but to honor his contract with Sterling Cooper. Um, not said is what provision of the contract they're referring to. Um, they're relying on him having a non-competition clause in, in his contract to prevent him from going somewhere else to work. Don then advises that he does not have a contract, meaning that he's free to go wherever he pleases. So ultimately, we're discussing a non-competition clause. The purpose of one of these is to ensure that an employee cannot leave and go to the competition into competition with their former employer. Um, at law, at common law, a nature of a clause of this nature is invalid as a restraint on trade. And the employer, in order for it to be valid, must prepare it in a very specific manner. Uh, even then, it's unlikely to be enforceable. Um, a recent change to the Ontario Employment Standards Act reinforces this rule and makes a non-competition clause preemptively illegal for anybody below a C-suite role, which Don is not in. So there's two lessons here. Uh, one is for both employer and employee, uh, which is to never take anything for granted. And if something is important, to ensure that it's in writing. Uh, the second is from the employer's perspective. Uh, when carrying out the, a purchase of a business, do your due diligence. The knowledge of the existence of the, or lack of an existence of a contract should not be coming at this late of a stage in the game. The purchase is almost complete at this point, and they're finding out that there's no paper in place. It's just too late for this to matter. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't point this out earlier, and, and you've been uh, too humble to the Mad Men background going behind you, which I thought was very, very trendy. Um, I did want to add to that comment or that clip anyways. It, this happens a lot where we have clients call and they assume that someone has a contract. They assume that the, there's a termination clause. There's, they assume there's not a solicitation agreement somewhere and they find out there isn't. And I may have actually told this story before, so I apologize if I've taught, told it you know, in the context of Fire Away, but I had a client many years ago who called me because they were adamant. They had caught someone breaching their policy against selling outside of their territory. And they said they had the employee dead to rights with all the evidence. And they, I, of course, said, send me the evidence. And they sent me a bunch of emails, which clearly showed this woman selling outside of her province. Uh, so I said, okay, great, just send me the policy. And I knew something was wrong when a week and then two weeks went by and I didn't hear anything from them. So I eventually called up the director of HR and, and she very sheepishly admitted that they looked and realized that although everyone knew what the policy was, they'd never actually reduced it to writing. So uh, another good example of how you just can't make assumptions or as, as Jeff said, you're going to be in a really, really weak position. Even, even getting back to the George, uh, George incident from earlier in Seinfeld, even if things seem self-evident, you got you to put these things in writing. So... I will take the next clip and we are back to Superstore again. And uh, this one deals with, uh, well, it's one example, I should say, of how the company deals with potential union drives. Studies show that employees at a non-union facility are more engaged and happier. Yeah! Don't try to come between me and Cloud9. That's my bay. Well said. Not sure how I feel about this new MC Cool Cloud. Yeah, there's something profoundly disturbing about seeing a two-dimensional cartoon character in three dimensions. Like with the Peanuts movie. I had no idea that Charlie Brown was a bald child with a deformed head. It's like a bruised apple. I know. No union better mess with my family. Oh, MC Cool Cloud. You're gonna be the best dad. Oh, whoa. Gross. I'm sorry, did MC Cool Cloud just impregnate a human? I think he did. Okay, does anybody have any thoughts about the video? I mean, I'm a little disappointed. I thought you were showing us Paddington. Uh, no, I never... I also heard it was going to be Paddington. I don't know where these Paddington rumors got started. I thought it was a one-sided, fear-mongering piece of corporate propaganda. Well, nobody asked your opinion, so... Oh, I thought you did when you said, does anybody have any thoughts on this video? Well, I, I found it interesting to learn that unions actually limit communication. Good point, Dina. It's like, when you have a problem, do you want to be able to come straight to me, or do you want to have to go through some shop steward like in the video? Definitely you. All right, so putting aside the whole issue of the manager 
uh, having a relationship with a subordinate, which could be from a content for a whole other show, and putting aside the image of the cloud character apparently impregnating an employee. Um, the whole, I love the way this show talks about union drive. And I was trying to find a clip. I could not find it. So if anybody finds it, please send me a link. Because uh, there was one episode where a couple of people started to talk about unions. And all of a sudden, HR was just all over this store. They were calling, they were visiting, making sure everyone was happy. And clearly, they had been listening to the employee conversations, which is another no no. We've talked about privacy a little bit already. So, bottom line here is there are very strict rules regarding what employers can and cannot say when it comes to addressing potential union drives. So, you can't mislead employees, as this video seemed to do. You can't denigrate the unions. You can't mention potential reprisals of so if someone joins a union or, or even if I start a union uh, or suggest the employees are going to be worse off. And here, Cloud9, not surprisingly, breaches a whole bunch of those rules. So, you know, lesson here is if you hear about a potential union drive, you can't react in haste. You should never penalize the employees that are involved. And you should not assume that you can say whatever you want, uh, even if you think it's true in order to try to counter the union drive. Because as I said, there are very strict limits on what you can and can't do in that context. And one of the possible penalties if you go overboard is an automatic certification of the union. So you might actually end up shooting yourself in the foot by trying to prevent it and ending up with exactly what you want to avoid. The expression that I always learned was uh, it's uh, tips. You can't threaten, intimidate, promise, or spy in the context of a union drive. And yeah, there's also the option that they could bring an unfair labor practice in the course of the organizing campaign, which is, it costs nothing for the union to do and it costs everything for the employer to have to respond to. Exactly, I, I, I'd forgotten about tips, but that's a great, uh, a great acronym. I'm going to try to remember what you shouldn't do. So thanks, Jeff. So we're now going to switch back to yet another one of my favorite shows, The Simpsons, uh, in, in its early days. So Alex, yeah, you're going to introduce this one. So this clip begins after Homer has put a donut in the reactor core to enlarge it so that he can share it with his coworkers. Uh, sir, we found the problem. Some idiot threw this in the reactor core. Dick, yes. You did this? How could you be so irresponsible? Uh, it's my first day. Since I'd never seen you before, maybe it is your first day. Very well, carry on. Ah, uh, sir, that's Homer Simpson. He's been working here for ten years. Oh, really? Why did you think you could lie to me? It's my first day. Well, why didn't you say, oh, whoa, you are fired! So, in that clip, after uh, Homer put the donut in the reactor core, it uh, potentially caused a nuclear meltdown. For our purposes, the clip is relevant because of what Homer did after he was confronted about it. Uh, he lied about it, uh, he was caught in the lie, and he was fired. Now, in Ontario, an employee is being confronted about allegations of misconduct. The employee's response is often a critical factor in determining whether or not there is just cause for dismissal. It's more likely that an employee will get a second chance if they're honest about the misconduct and if they indicate some mitigating factors uh, about their behavior. On the other hand, an employee who lies about their misconduct or tries to cover it up will be further damaging the employment relationship, will be indicating that they're untrustworthy, and will be giving their employer a further reason why the employment relationship has been damaged beyond repair. In this case, Homer was immediately fired. And that's often what we see when an employee lies to their employer after, uh, sorry, lies to their employer after being confronted about allegations of misconduct, even if the misconduct alone wouldn't necessarily have resulted in termination if they were simply honest about what happened. Thanks, Alex. It's a, a topic near and dear to my heart, and, and something we write about in every update to my book, and we blog about it constantly, and we always encourage our clients, if they think an employee is guilty of misconduct, you've got to investigate. I mentioned that earlier. Part of the investigation has to include confronting the individual. And as you said, they often give you more or stronger grounds for dismissal, such as if they are dishonest, if they mislead you, if they, or if they threaten witnesses, as we, we've seen in, in cases before. Uh, so even though there's often a reluctance to engage in the investigation or this theory that, oh, of course, the person's going to lie, so why bother? In fact, it puts you in a stronger position if they do. 
Uh, so most investigations don't uh, aren't carried out quite this quickly, but in this case, you've got clear evidence that Homer was the one who put the donut in the reactor and caused the meltdown. And then you've got him lying twice to the owner of the company. So would that be cause? Well, given all of uh, Homer's previous misconduct and poor performance that I've seen, I think it probably would be. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to take the next clip, which is a clip from Friends. And uh, I wasn't even sure how to really characterize or define this other than to say it's uh, a great lesson in what not to do when you are attending a job interview. Anyway, so we were saying goodbye and, uh, oh. What happened? All right, we, well, we were shaking hands and he kind of leaned in toward me. You know, maybe he was going to open the door, but I totally misread him and I, uh. <laughs> Kissed him? I, I didn't know what else to do. Well, you could have tried not kissing him. Thanks, Chandler. Hey, Rach, a guy from Ralph Lauren called. You got a second interview. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Come on in. Okay. It's really nice to see you again. Thank you. Oh, Rachel, uh... uh... Just, uh... Excuse me? Yeah, let me... Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. Okay, I see, I see what's going on here. Listen, look, look. I am sorry if I have given you the wrong impression, but I am not some hussy who will just sleep around to get ahead. Now, well, even, I, hey, hey, even I, though I kissed you, that, that does not give you the right to demand sex from me. I do not want this job that bad. Good day, sir. <laughs> going in there to see Mr. Zellner. I hope you're ready to put out. I am. Uh, first, I, I would like to say thank you for agreeing to see me again. That's uh, quite all right, but I feel obligated to tell you that this meeting is being videotaped. Okay. Um, well, first, I would like to start by apologizing for kissing you and uh, for yelling at you. Fair enough. Now, you're probably going to hire one of the people who, uh, who, did, who did not um, <clears throat> yell at you and storm out. And I think that's a big, big mistake, and here's why. I made a huge fool of myself, and I came back. That shows courage. When I thought you wanted sex in exchange for this job, I said no. That shows integrity. And I was not afraid to stand up for myself, and that shows courage. Okay. Now, I, I know that I, I've already said courage, but you know, you got to have courage. And, um, and finally, when I thought you were making sexual advances in the workplace, I said no, and I was not litigious. So there you go. You got, you got courage, you got integrity, you got courage again, and not litigious. Look, Mr. Zellner. Zellner! I knew that. Oh, I knew that. I, I really, really want this job, and I think I, think I would be really good at it. It only occurred to me watching that now for probably the seventh or eighth time that one of the mistakes that the company made was not having a second person in the interview room. Uh, probably shouldn't need to record them, but having a second person there would be good. Um, yeah, obviously, don't kiss the person interviewing you. Interviewing you is one of the tips we can probably pretty easily give you. Um, but more importantly, to, to again try to turn this into somewhat of a serious discussion, uh, all of the rules about sexual harassment apply not only to employees, but also to candidates. So when we're talking about that context, you know, we have heard the stories about people who have been actually harassed and told that if they want a job, they are going to have to provide sexual favors. And it's important for people to know that they do have rights, they do have remedies, and how to go about enforcing them. So that's one thing we've seen a lot more of in the last few years, uh, but we still hear these stories all the time. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to play devil's advocate and try to defend really anybody in this scenario, but it is, uh, it is fun to watch. Uh, Brittany, you get the last clip from something called Killing the Eve. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. A very fun and uplifting show. <laughs> yeah. So as Stuart said, our last clip comes from a show I actually just binge watched recently called Killing Eve. My absolute favorite character in this show is Carolyn, who plays the head of MI6's Russia desk. She is hilariously blunt and she has a really interesting relationship with all of her colleagues and subordinates. So in this clip, she's interacting with the main character, Eve. Okay, so, well, that's it. That's what? Well, it's over. You, you fired me. Oh, yes, I did. Um, well, lucky for you, circumstances have changed. Come on. Okay, great. So um, in this in this short clip, we basically see uh, Carolyn seeming to have forgotten that she has fired Eve and deciding that she is going to rehire her on the spot and expect her to just continue doing her bidding. So hopefully it goes without saying that you cannot simply fire and unfire employees at will. So if we were providing advice to Carolyn, uh, we would have told her that when you dismiss an employee, there should be no ambiguity about it. And in particular, both parties should be absolutely clear about when the last day of work is. Um, the other thing that we can take away from this clip is that an employer actually cannot unilaterally decide that an employee will simply continue working beyond their last day. In this case, Eve could absolutely have refused to assist Carolyn further as she's no longer her employee. Uh, in addition, from Carolyn's perspective, she may have inadvertently created an entirely new contractual relationship between the parties because the terms and conditions of Eve's old employment don't just automatically carry over to this new relationship that's being created. So a lot of no's here for my fave, Carolyn. <laughs> well, thanks, Brittany. And you make a great point that you can't just fire and unfire someone. The, the only thing I'll add, because this sometimes surprises people, especially employers, in, in many contexts, you can resign and then unresign. Uh, courts are a lot more willing to forgive someone for resigning in the heat of the moment if they come back fairly quickly and if basically the employer hasn't suffered any prejudice. If they haven't gone out, hired anybody new, if it's the next day, they probably haven't. Uh, then in many cases, you as an employer are going to be expected to take them back, and that surprises a lot of people. But uh, we've had a bunch of case law on that point, so that's the one exception. But uh, Otherwise, we've seen ambiguous hiring today, we've seen ambiguous firing, and none of that is, is a good thing. So that's uh, that's all the clips we have for today. And now uh, we're going to take our, take our collective chance to uh, to fire away. So what we've done is we're each going to give one, one example of the top employment law mistakes that you may be making, and uh, some may relate to some of the clips we've seen and some may not. So Brittany, I think you're up first. Great. So I think mine is is pretty obvious. It's that reacting emotionally or without due consideration to employee misconduct is always a big mistake. Employers should always be taking the time to think about the appropriate disciplinary response in the full context of the situation. Jeff, it, uh, always keep your hands up. Always keep your hands up. Protect yourself at all times, uh, particularly in the workplace. Um, I, I, in all seriousness, yeah, an, an employer that uh, fails to carry out due diligence uh, may find itself unable to proceed with its plans. And if something is important, um, not having it in writing is always going to be a mistake. Uh, it never hurts to have something in writing and to confirm that that thing is in writing and that it is, in fact, legally binding and valid by reviewing it with an employment lawyer. Document, 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 which is a good segue to Nadia. Yeah, so one of the common mistakes we'll, we see is not documenting your concerns or the steps that you took to warn an employee about their behavior, conduct, or performance issues. And that can actually come back to bite you in the short and long run. And as we often say, and Stuart uh, stole, stole my words, document, right. document, document. And of course, we can guide you through that process to minimize liability. Sorry about that, idea. Alex, you're up next. Mine is employees and employers signing employment contracts without first getting legal advice. We see a lot of employment contracts that are clearly unenforceable, that are simply put before an employee and without any legal advice beforehand that, that just can't be enforced and, and, and don't do anything to, to limit entitlements upon termination. And many employees sign contracts without realizing exactly what it is that they're giving up. 
Um, so that's the biggest mistake I see on both ends, uh, proceeding with employment contracts without getting any advice on it first. Great, thanks, Alex. And I'll, I'll pick up on a similar thing. My, my top or one of my top mistakes is terminating an employee without getting legal advice. Uh, don't assume that what someone did is just cause. Don't assume that your termination clause is enforceable. Don't assume you don't have to pay them their accrued bonus or commissions after they, you let them go. We see a lot of this where employers try to save money by not getting legal advice before the termination, and then we've got to help them clean up the mess. And, and as we always say, it almost always costs more to fix a problem than to prevent it. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make. And those are all of our top tips for today. That's also all the time we have for season five, episode four of Fire Away. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I want to thank my amazing team members for joining me for a really fun episode today. So thank you, Brittany, Nadia, Alex, and Jeff. I want to remind everyone that at Run Your Law, we encourage people to treat their employment relationships as legal relationships and make informed decisions rather than assumptions. I'll invite you to keep up to date on employment law by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, liking our Facebook page, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and subscribing to our, our newsletter as well. And I'm hoping we're getting to the point where I can stop saying this, but although we're making progress on the COVID front, you need to keep up to date on workplace related or workplace COVID related issues by checking out our blog and our COVID-19 resource center. But as we always say, none of that replaces legal advice tailored to your specific circumstances. If you think you might need an employment lawyer, you probably do, so feel free to reach out to us. Reminder that past episodes can be found on YouTube, on our website, archived on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you like our page or subscribe to our channel, you'll get notification when episodes are live. And our next episode will be on June 21st. We're still finalizing the guest and the topic, but we will, of course, get the word out on social media as soon as we can. Thank you very much, Rob, for keeping this organized. And thank you, Rebecca, for all of your help and Mark as well. And thanks for tuning in. See you next time.